the last lesson is a short story written by alphonse daudet alphonse daudet was a french novelist and a short story writer alphonse penned his first novel at the tender age of 14 alphonse got married in 1867 to french author julia allard the couple had three children together his many works include the story collection monday tales the play larlesian the novels the nabob the sappho and several volumes of memba alphonse daudet died on 16 december 1897 in paris while he was having dinner he was 57 at that time now let us see from where this story is taken the last lesson is an extract from contes du langi a collection of short stories of alphonse daudet contes du langi means monday tales in english the last lesson is set as if it had happened 150 years ago during the days of franco prussian war which took place between 1870 and 1871 in that war france was defeated by prussia led by otto von bismarck the first prime minister and first ever chancellor of prussia the country prussia does not exist now it consisted of the parts of germany poland and austria as the prussians defeated the border districts alsace and lorraine they took those two districts under their full control the prussians not only dominated the land but also the language spoken by the people there so that they can take away their identity students before watching the video of the story let us know the characters in the story he is franz he narrates the entire story he is a student of m hamel he is m hamel he is the teacher of franz here m is a french letter and its expansion is monsieur monsieur means mr or sir to make it easy for you i have substituted mr in place of m throughout the lesson he is watcher the blacksmith he is old horse now let us watch the video I started for school very late that morning and was in great dread of a scolding especially because Mr Hamel had said that he would question us on participles and I did not know the first word about them For a moment I thought of running away and spending the day outdoors It was so warm so bright The birds were chirping at the edge of the woods and in the open field back of the sawmill the Prussian soldiers were drumming. It was all much more tempting than the rules for participles, but I had the strength to resist and hurried off to school. When I passed the town hall there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. For the last 2 years all our bad news had come from there. the lost battles the draft the orders of the commanding officer and i thought to myself without stopping what can be the matter now then as i hurried as fast as i could go the blacksmith watched her who was there with his apprentice reading the bulletin called after me don't go so fast bob you will get to your school in plenty of time I thought he was making fun of me. And reached Mr. Hamel's little garden more out of breath. Usually, when school began, there was a great bustle which could be heard out in the street, the opening and closing of desks, lessons repeated in unison, very loud, with our hands over our ears to understand better, and the teacher's great ruler rapping on the table. But now it was also still. I had counted on the commotion. 
to get my desk without being seen, but, of course, that day everything had to be as quiet as Sunday morning. Through the window I saw my classmates, already in their places, and Mr. Hamill walking up and down with his terrible iron ruler under his arm. I had to open the door, and go in before everybody. You can imagine how I blushed, and how frightened I was. But nothing happened, Mr. Hamill saw me, and said very kindly. Go to your place quickly little friends. We were beginning without you. Okay sir. Thanks. I jumped over the bench, and sat down at my desk. Not till then, when I had got a little over my fright, did I see, that our teacher had on his beautiful green coat, his frilled shirt, and the little black silk cap, all embroidered, that he never wore, except on inspection and prize days. Besides, the whole school seemed so strange and solemn. But the thing, that surprised me most was to see, on the back benches that were always empty, the village people sitting quietly like ourselves, old Horser, with his three-cornered hat, the former mayor, the former postmaster, and several others besides. Everybody looked sad, and Horser had brought an old primer, thumbed at the edges, and he held it open on his knees with his great spectacles lying across the pages. While I was wondering about it all. Mr. Hamill mounted his chair, and, in the same grave and gentle tone which he had used to me, said, My children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of Alsace and Lorraine. The new master comes tomorrow. This is your last French lesson. I want you to be very attentive. What a thunderclap these words were to me. Oh, the wretches, that was what they had put up at the town hall. My last French lesson. Why I hardly knew how to write. I should never learn any more. I must stop there, then. Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons. For seeking bird's eggs. We have fetched four eggs today. Or going sliding on the saw. My books, that had seemed such a nuisance a while ago, so heavy to carry. My grammar, and my history of the saints, were old friends. Now that I couldn't give up. And Mr. Hamill too. The idea that he was going away, that I should never see him again, made me forget all about his ruler, and how cranky he was. Poor man. It was in honor of this last lesson, that he had put on his fine Sunday clothes. And now I understand why the old men of the village were sitting there in the back of the room. It was because they were sorry too, that they had not gone to school more. It was their way of thanking our master for his 40 years of faithful service. And of showing their respect for the country, that was his no more. While I was thinking of all this, I heard my name called. It was my turn to recite. Friends, could you define participle? Participle is a word formed from an adjective. No. Participle is a word formed from... 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 What would I not have given to be able to say that dreadful rule for the participle all through, very loud and clear, and without one mistake. But I got mixed up on the first words and stood there, holding on to my desk, my heart beating, and not daring to look up. I heard Mr. Hamill say to me, I won't scold you, little friends. You must feel bad enough. See how it is. Every day we have said to ourselves, Bah. I have plenty of time. I will learn it tomorrow. And now you see where we have come out. Ah, oh, that's the great trouble with Alsace. She puts off learning till tomorrow. Now those fellows out there will have the right to say to you, How is it? You pretend to be Frenchmen. And yet you can neither speak nor write your own language. But you are not the worst, 
poor little friends. We have all a great deal to reproach ourselves with. Your parents were not anxious enough to have you learn. They preferred to put you to work on a farm or at the mills, so as to have a little more money. And I. I have been to blame also. Have I not often sent you to water my flowers instead of learning your lessons? And when I wanted to go fishing, did I not just give you a holiday? Then, from one thing to another, Mr. Hamill went on to talk of the French language, saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world, the clearest, the most logical, that we must guard it among us, and never forget it, because when a people are enslaved, they hold fast to their language, as if it had the key to their prison. Then, he opened a grammar book and read us our lesson. I was amazed to see how well I understood it. All he said seemed so easy, so easy. I think too, that I had never listened so carefully, and that he had never explained everything with so much patience. It seemed almost, as if the poor man wanted to give us all he knew before going away, and to put it all into our hands at one stroke. After the grammar, we had a lesson on writing. That day Mr. Hamill had new copies for us, written in a beautiful round handwriting. France, Alsace. France, Alsace. They looked like little flags floating everywhere in the schoolroom, hung from the rod at the top of our desks. You ought to have seen how everyone set to work, and how quiet it was. The only sound was the scratching of the pens over the paper. Once some beetles flew in. But nobody paid attention to them. Not even the little ones, who worked right on tracing their fish hooks, as if that was French too. On the roof the pigeons cooed very low, and I thought to myself, Will they make the pigeons also, to sing in German language? Will they not even spare the pigeons too? Whenever I looked up from my desk, I saw Mr. Hamill sitting motionless in his chair, and gazing first at one thing, then at another, as if he wanted to fix in his mind just how everything looked in that little schoolroom. Fancy. For 40 years he had been there in the same place, with his garden outside, the window and his class in front of him, just like that. Only the desks and benches had been worn smooth, the walnut trees in the garden were taller, and the hop vine that he had planted himself twined about the windows to the roof. How it must have broken his heart to leave it all, poor man, to hear his sister moving about in the room above, packing their trunks, for they must leave the country the next day. But he had the courage to hear every lesson to the very last. After the writing, we had a lesson in history, and then the babies chanted their Bay, BB, Bo, Boo, Bay, BB, Bo, Boo. Down there at the back of the room the old hawser had put on his spectacles, and, holding his primer in both hands, spelled the letters with them. You could see that he too, was crying, his voice trembled with emotion. And it was so funny to hear him, that we all wanted to laugh and cry. Ah, how well I remember it, that last lesson. All at once the church clock struck 12. Then the Angelus. At the same moment the trumpets of the Prussians, returning from drill, sounded under our windows. Mr. Hamill stood up, very pale, in his chair. I never saw him look so tall. Mr. Hamill said, My friends, I, I, but something choked him. He could not go on. Then he turned to the blackboard, took a piece of chalk, and, bearing on with all his might, he wrote as large as he could, Vive la France. Then he stopped and leaned his head against the wall, and, 
Without a word, he made a gesture to us with his hand. School is dismissed. You may go. Hope you have enjoyed watching the lesson. Now, shall we sum up all that we have learned? Let us do it point by point. The foremost theme emphasized in this lesson is the importance of language. Language. The language that we speak is not only for communicating among ourselves. Languages are the primary means of keeping our culture alive. A language helps us to stay connected to our traditional values, cultural values and our roots. If a new language is imposed on us, strictly forbidding our mother tongue, the future generations tend to forget not only their own language but also their culture and traditions. Hence, love your mother tongue as it is loved by France. Who worries whether the pigeons too will be made to coo in German? Will they make the pigeons also to sing in German language? Remember, our language is our lifeline. As Mr. Hamel says, it holds the key to the prison. Because when a people are enslaved, they hold fast to their language, as if it had the key to their prison. The second lesson that can be learned from this lesson is, do not procrastinate. Many a times, we delay or put off the tasks to be done till the last minute or pass the deadlines. In this lesson, Franz and his classmates had postponed the learning till they were denied the opportunity to learn. Bah! I have plenty of time. I will learn it tomorrow. Even we may encounter such a situation, so never procrastinate. The third moral is, expect the unexpected. Anything can happen at any time. When M. Hamel announced that it was his last lesson, it was a thunderclap to France. What a thunderclap these words were to me. Till that he had taken things for granted. But now, when that lesson was his last lesson, what could be done? Nothing can be done. So, don't anticipate only good things throughout your life journey. Be prepared to face any challenges that you might come across. The last one in our list is don't waste time. Time waits for none. Life is short. The time allocated for us is too less. Time wasted is worse than wasted money. If you value your life, value time. Franz regrets for having wasted his time collecting eggs and going sliding on the river Saar, skipping his lessons. Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons. For seeking bird's eggs, or going sliding on the Saar. Franz also says that the old men of the village were sorry too, for they had not gone to school more. It was because they were sorry too that they had not gone to school more. Will the old men get another chance to do schooling? Never and ever. So never waste your precious time from now onwards. Do what you ought to do at the time destined for you. Apart from these, there are many more lessons to be learned from this lesson, the last lesson. Could you say what those are? Try to pursue more by provoking your thoughts. My best wishes. Thanks for watching.